my presentation on Dungeons and Dragons and Social Competence by me, Brendan Galbraith. Before we get too in depth, there are two main topics we have to talk about in this introduction. The first is Dungeons and Dragons. D&D is a specific role-playing tabletop game. In it, you are either a player or the game master. The players create characters for the world run by the game master, and it is powered through one's imagination. The game is a highly interactive one, with your ability to talk to others being a major aspect of the game. You may be wondering, why do research on a tabletop game which probably doesn't affect that many people? This statement, however, is false, as there are an estimated 50 million people who have played D&D in the past, with around 13.7 million actively playing it, and that number includes me. For me, this was an important topic to research because of the impact it has had on me as a person. It allowed me to connect with my older brother, who's 12 years older than me, and introduced me to the game, and it lets me grow closer to my friends by playing it every day at lunch. This shows how massive the game is, both by the numbers you see up here and also by the personal experiences it can give the people who play it, and the impact it has on those people. Any social benefits or negatives gained from the social game would have massive effects on whoever played. The next part of my introduction is social competence, which is the whole of one's ability to be a social person. The way that this study and many others categorize this is through a tri-component model with three different parts building the whole. All, part, all the parts are important to build the entirety of social competence. Without all three, it wouldn't be social competence. The first part is social skills, which are the skills you use within social situations. The next level is social performance, or how well people are using their social skills. And the final level is social adjustment, which is an individual's attainment of their social goals. This all sounds well and good, right? There's a unified way to think about social competence, and D&D is a social game. What's the problem with this? Well, because of how massive the game is, and how important social interaction is within it, Dungeons and Dragons has a large impact on people's social abilities, for better or worse. Along with that, there are many negative stereotypes, which we'll get into later, which persist about the game and have made people see it in a negative light. And that should be analyzed more closely to find its validity. This brings us to my question. What impact does playing Dungeons and Dragons have on a high schooler's social competence? The founding of many of these stereotypes that come with Dungeons and Dragons comes from a group called BAT, also known as Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons. They were founded in the 1980s and pushed many different ideas about the game. The main two that they had, that they're attributed with, are the idea that the game is devil worship and is an isolating experience making you unable to talk to others. The other stereotypes mentioned here are ones that are often thrown around in different communities, uh, such as the game being very nerdy and the people who play it are weird. This is a very negative connotation and follows with bad attempted push against the game. Many studies have looked into these claims, including the Renards immediately after the group collapsed in the 90s and Goodall's more recent 2021 study, and they both found that these stereotypes were overblown and were an attempt to villainize the game. For the isolating part specifically, they found the exact opposite and the game was actually one that united people together. And this brings me into my next section, the previously found benefits. There are a lot of these, and it would take a while to name all of them, so I'm just gonna focus on the most important ones uh, and the ones that appeared the most in all of the research. Researchers found that Dungeons and Dragons helps with someone's creativity and self-efficacy, gives the structure needed for people with different kinds of disorders, such as being on the autism spectrum or schizoid, the ability to grow friendships and talk with others thanks to the structure the game gives. It can also grow a person's empathy and the concern they have for others, uh, gives a similar help to other social experiences, such as an old MMORPG called EverQuest Online Adventures, where because it was advantageous to work with others, that skill grew as you played the game. This is the same in D&D, since the game becomes easier if you work with your group instead of being antagonistic towards each other. Finally, while these studies' findings were near universal in the benefits they found, they focus on the age range of college students or children, usually under the age of 12. While the judge show conformity with its findings, they were able to ensure that they were accurate because they tested it multiple times, it did leave gaps that need to be covered. First, I was unable to find studies focusing on teenagers or people within the age range of 13 to 18. This is likely because it's more difficult to get permission from minors than it is the readily available college student and doesn't directly study early development as it happens with children, so this population was left out. Another gap was the idea of social competence as a whole. It wasn't really mentioned by anyone who studied the game, and so this is a new lens to look at D&D's assistance. So what's my methodology? I did a mixed method as a combination of both qualitative and quantitative 
quantitative research to get as wide of a viewpoint as possible. This is useful to find people's own opinions on their social ability and has been used in many similar sources. Because people are self-reporting, there is the possibility of exaggeration with a survey on how social they are, while the semi-structured interviews more personal connection should remedy much of that, the, that issue. As just mentioned, my first part is a, is a survey, where people were asked questions split into three different categories, all the parts of the social competence that I showed earlier. These questions were a Likert scale of one to five, one meaning they were nothing like the thing said, and five meaning they were exactly like them. There were two groups in the survey, a portion who did play and a portion who didn't play D&D. This allowed me to more easily compare their information since, uh, since they were each on their own section of the data separated from any accidental mixing of numbers. The validity of using surveys for social research was delved into by Young in his study in 2015, where he found that surveys were very effective at looking at large pieces of information and combining both qualitative and quantitative research, which is an important part of my study and so helped verify that a survey was the right method for me, at least for the first half. The next part was semi-structured interviews. As with the survey, this was a common strategy on other studies, which is why I'm emulating it here. This was only a small portion of the total who played D&D since they had to select a specific answer to sign up for it, and it was mostly used to confirm what the numbers in the survey were saying and to hear people's more in-depth opinion on things. It also helps remedy the possible lying or exaggeration that can occur within the survey because it's harder to lie to someone straight to their face than it is on an anonymous interview, an anonymous survey online. My total population was 70. Of that 70, 43 people did not play Dungeons and Dragons. The other 27 selected that they did. That's just the split down between the population. So on to my results. There's a lot of numbers, so I'm going to try to keep it pretty simple with my explanation here. Uh, for the social adjustment aspect, uh, the average score out of 5 for people who did not play D&D was a 3.61, whereas for the people who did, it was a 3.43. By the way, the higher the number, the better it is for you socially, so a 5 would be perfect and 1 would be the worst possible. Uh, for social performance, uh, people who did not play D&D got an average score of 3.10, whereas for people who did play, it was a 2.63. Then, for social skills, the average for people who didn't play was 3.18, whereas did, it was 2.97. And finally, for social competence as a whole, the average score for people who did not play was 3.29, but for people who did play, it was a 3.01. From my interviews, it appeared as though people were hesitant to believe possible benefits that would come from Dungeons and Dragons. When asked to give them a score out of 5, everyone gave a score of 3, even though with the actual numbers, they were often a lot higher than a 3. When asked what benefits might come from D&D, the most common answer was that talking in large groups was made easier for playing the game. Along with that, the time they had been playing the game had little effect on their overall scores, with the average staying the same throughout. This could be due to a lack of unique age response, not age responses, but responses for how long they played the game. Most of my responses were over three years, so there weren't a lot from less than that. Uh, also, an interesting thing to note is that there was a universal dip with social performance, both groups falling dramatically there. From the results, I found that Dungeons and Dragons scores were generally lower than the general population. This breaks with other studies' findings, since all the ones that I found believed that Dungeons and Dragons had a positive effect on your social ability. From a combination of my results and the results of others and other research, here are the possible reasons I found for this anomaly. The first is that Dungeons and Dragons actually harms someone's social ability. The issue with this is that this claim has been mostly refuted in other sources, and so, uh, it is, and so is an unlikely outcome. The next, however, is far more likely. The more likely explanation is that people believe the stereotypes, or some of them, that were mentioned during my literature review. While this may not at first make much sense, certain pieces of information make this seem more likely. As this was a self-reporting survey, the answers that people chose may not be the actual truth, but instead what they believe to be the truth. Couple that with the fact that bothered about Dungeons and Dragons stereotypes still exist today, and you can make the logical connection that people believe that the game is harmful due to what they have been told in the media and by others. This information was corroborated by the interviews I did. Most people were hesitant to trust benefits from the social game D&D, which is shown to be connected. It also feels like the most logical conclusion that playing games that are social will help you grow your social ability. However, people didn't trust this, and this gives credence to the idea that there's already some 
sort of held belief that Dungeons and Dragons will have a negative effect on you socially, or at least have no positive effect. The implications. With the belief in the idea that Dungeons and Dragons does not help, it means the game's possible benefits are not understood. Along with that, it shows that the belief in stereotypes has an impact on self-perception if that stereotype relates to you, and makes people miss out on the positives. While this was found in my study, I am not the only person to find this within research, which gives credence to this implication, because there have been studies that have found this in the past with other kinds of stereotypes, and so the stereotypes of D&D will likely follow the same pattern. Uh, it also shows that bad, though they may have fallen apart in the late 80s, still has an impact on many people's minds. Finally, this shows that the stereotypes for D&D still exist despite information proving them wrong. There was one, limit, one main limitation with my research, however, which was population size. Because my population size was relatively small, it makes it harder to generalize my information for the entirety of the people who play Dungeons and Dragons. However, there is still good insight which can be uncovered through my findings, thanks to the addition of these semi-structured interviews, adding that personal conversation and that personal connection with the data, um, making it more qualitative. And for qualitative, you don't need quite as many people than quantitative, which makes the less, the lower population size not as big of a deal. To conclude this presentation, I would like to briefly summarize my findings and what re future research could go on with. My findings differed from what previous studies found. This was likely because it was self-reported and there was an underlying belief that the game would not have a positive effect, showing that the stereotypes exist until today. To continue on the research, it would be beneficial to hone in deeper into the connections with stereotypes. To do this, there should be more of a focus on this aspect to make a stronger connection. For example, more specific questions relating to these uh, two stereotypes in the semi-structure interview, or specific questions on the survey about stereotypes and what they think about them. Finally, it would be useful to compare it to different age demographics, just to see if the same findings occur with non-teenagers, or if it's something that is just found within this age range. Terrific. Thanks, Brendan. I have a few questions for you and then we'll wrap this up. So for the first one, talk a little bit about your initial exploration of the scholarly work and how that helped you to refine your research question. So at first I was looking for things that had to do with Dungeons and Dragons. I wanted to see if it helped with anything. And all the studies I was finding focused on the social aspect of the game and how it could help you there. And from there, I wanted to get a certain definition about social skills that I liked and I found social competence and combining both of those was something that really interests me because again I really like D&D and it seems like it has a really big impact on someone's social ability so I wanted to look more into that and combine the two. Okay, terrific. As a follow-up to that how do your findings provide directions for future research in this field? You talked a little bit about it could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so mine was one of the first, actually the only one that I found that had to do with stereotypes and people's own self-perception on it. And because of that, that opens up a whole new pathway for the research to look more in on the stereotypes of Dungeons and Dragons and uh, trying to maybe break that to see if people who once believed in the stereotypes, if they stop believing in them, if they can actually see the benefits that come with Dungeons and Dragons. There's a few ways you can take the future research and it'll be very interesting. Terrific. And then the last one, let's ask the skills question. So what was the most important skill that you acquired in going through this process? And what do you think you could apply that skill to in the future? I think the skill that this helped grow the most for me was the actual research aspect of doing a, making a study. Uh, because you need the literature review to actually build on what you want to do. Um, I really improved the way I can actually find studies. Um, I've become more efficient at reading them and that can help me in other aspects. So like even not making presentations, just reading about studies and wanting to read and learn about things. The way that I've learned to look at stuff um, from this, doing this, will continue on throughout the rest of my life and also help me with college with reading. You gotta read a lot in college. So there's a lot that this helps me with. Terrific. Thanks very much.